Well, welcome all you wiretappers out there back here in the studio, Gangland Wire. And if you're on YouTube, you can see I have a couple of uh, of uh, guests that have been on here regularly and semi-regularly. Uh, Cam Camulus Robinson and Paul Whitcomb from Chicago. We're going to Chicago today, folks. So welcome, Cam and Paul. I really appreciate you guys coming on helping tell this story. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. As you know, now Cam's got a book out there somewhere and I'm supposed to get an interview with Frank Calabrese Jr.'s wife who is uh, who he wrote the book with the story of being married to the mob shall we say in Chicago how how's that coming along Ken? I, so final edits I've seen the cover and uh we've turned everything in should be going to print here very soon uh all the all the edits it's written and and done and uh they just uh everything is set to pop so we okay, are good. good to go what was the final title? Uh, uh, final title we went with was uh, Chicago Swan Song, A Mob Wife Story. Okay. All right. Look her for name that is guys. Lisa Swan. Yeah. Lisa Swan's her name. Like Look that. for that, guys. And, and I'm going to have an interview with him and, and Lisa Swan here uh, probably about the time it comes out. So we'll we'll be you'll be hearing from us on Facebook and and on the podcast here. We want to see that book get read by a lot of people. Don't we cam? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. The more the merrier. The more the merrier. I mean, not, not only, you know, you, you, you want readers. I understand being an author or a podcaster or whatever you want people to, to, to digest your work. I, I just want to know yeah. people are digesting my work. Uh, you know, there's, there is the money angle to it, but I think it'll be really valuable information, a real different, insight into the chicago outfit we've never had that before yeah it is that validation it is sort of seeing what what goes on is i think uh paul said it best what comes home when the mobster uh uh, comes home for dinner so uh (laughs) you know it it, that was that was paul's wording in uh in uh, an interview we we did the initial interview and i really think that that says it i mean this is this is what what the family is going through i think we sort of get windows with you know carmelo soprano or uh karen hill in the movie uh goodfellas but We really take a deep dive, and it, it it's a uh, it's quite a story. Yeah, or even uh, Gerard and Karen and Deborah Gravano, you know, and they That's got right. caught up in that uh, ecstasy thing down in uh, Phoenix, and and all of them caught a case behind it. So I mean, you know, the family that does crime together goes to jail together. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but families are part of it. That, that's that's one thing I find mm-hmm. so fascinating about the mob is the family is they have families first of all that they're engaged with and, and do things with and, and care about. So, uh, you know, most of your regular scumbag criminals out there, you know, two bit gang bangers and stuff on the street and drug dealers and all that, they don't have families. They don't live that other life, a regular life. And that's what to me is so fascinating about the mob is that mm-hmm. you have that other aspect of these guys they are more than one dimensional. Right. All right. So we're going to talk about, Kind of start with Sam Wings Carlisi. Uh, now, first of all, I found two different explanations for his name Wings. One said he could outrun everybody. He was like he could dodge everybody. He had wings. The other one was that he flew around the country because he had contacts around the country and flew around the country was like an emissary maybe for the outfit around the country. So what do you guys think on that, on getting that nickname Wings? There's no doubt that he flew all over the country passing messages. And that's the most popular explanation for why he was called Wings. He was, he was also Black Sam. Uh, so either one would work. I I, I think that uh, the messenger theory is probably right. What do you think, Camillus? I, I yeah, I think that that's I think that's probably probably the case. I think that that it, it, he was he was uh, flying around more, and is and I tend to defer to you and, and your expertise in, in this. I mean, nobody knows Carly C. Who like you, you were sitting there. But uh, he, he was traveling around, and that that does draw attention, and that would sort of broaden the scope of his of his nickname to people around the country. And that's the one that's known more broadly. Chicago, he's Black Sam, but around the country, he's Wings. Wings, and I believe he had some really close family connections with Buffalo mob back east. I, I believe with Magdalena. Sure did. Family. I mean, he was from there, and his brother was Capo in okay. the Buffalo family, which mm-hmm. then then bled into. Sam's 
we're bringing uh, the initiation ceremony back into Chicago. I think that was the influence of his brother and the and the LCN and the East Coast that led him to ask Ayupa's permission to do that in Chicago in late seventies and early eighties. Interesting, yeah, because you know Chicago, the outfit was started by a guy from Naples, Al Capone, and so they mm-hmm. didn't have the Sicilian mafia traditions and and didn't do the making ceremony until. Uh, I didn't realize exactly who it was. I knew it was somewhere around Iupa who was Sicilian. I assume Carlisi must have been had Sicilian mm-hmm. roots too. Right. Oh, interesting. Well, I'm glad to know that. I never really looked into that. I, I knew that there was a time when they started doing that. So, uh, you know, uh, Carlisi had been a driver for Iupa. I, is that correct? He started even lower than that. Uh, Bill Romer said that the first time he ran into Sam Carlisi, he was parking cars at one of Ayupa's clubs in Cicero. It was literally a nobody. And he worked his way up from, from the very bottom. But uh, he was also related with a lot of other mobsters in Chicago. And I have a photograph of Carlisi from about 1962 with uh, Joe Andriaki uh, drinking together. And So very early on, Carlisi was heavily involved with Joey Aupa Cicero regime. And that's how he got his start. He followed Joey Aupa up. And by the 70s, Aupa's uh, driver died and Carlisi took over. Okay. And that's how he made all the contacts connected the, with the political contacts uh, and became essentially Aupa's right hand man. Right. That driver, that's a pretty important position mm-hmm. for the reasons that you said, Paul, that you get to meet the political contacts. You get to meet the contacts with other crews that you maybe work with. You're not in this little silo just doing your own little gambling operation, your own little loan sharking operation or burglary crew or whatever. You're there next to the man to meet other people. So when it comes time yeah. to move on up, you're ready to move on up because you got the contacts. And he was right. doing it at the height of outfit power. This is the the early seventies yeah. through the nineteen eighty six the straw man convictions. Carlisi was right there, and this is at a time when outfit power was unbelievable. They had all the skim from Las Vegas, uh, the unions. It, 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 he was at the real height of things to to observe how it was done from the very top. And of course, Ricardo was right there as well, still giving advice. Yeah. So they still had the links of all the way back to the beginning. So Ayupa goes to jail for a long time out of this uh, straw man cases, as they're known and uh, the government called them the straw man cases. So straw man two, I think, was the Chicago end of it. And he goes to jail for a long time. So that leaves Carlisi in the catbird seat, I guess, to move on in. Yeah. And the, the interesting thing about it is at the time, the press and the government all thought it was Joe Ferriola who yeah. was the man. And Carlisi was operating pretty quietly in the background. He was very, very close to Ayupa. And it, it was Carlisi that became the boss. Ferriola was still extremely influential. And they were both Cicero guys. <clears throat> Carlisi was more Melrose Park faction, but uh, they were both uh, pretty close. And Ferriola never had the good health or the strength to to really challenge anything there. So by 89, Ferriola was dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. and, and Carlisi was uh, standing alone. It wasn't until then, though, that authorities even really had a photograph of Carlisi. A lot of the crime charts of the 70s, you'll see a blank spot. They just didn't know who he was, which is surprising because even as late as, as early as 1967, you have reports of Sam Carlisi being arrested in Cicero related to gambling. Mm-hmm. By, and at that time he was going as, by the name of Drago, which is mm-hmm. pretty interesting. But uh, the, the name Wings had not come out yet, at least in the press. And which also leads me to believe it didn't come from him being real fast. Cause I don't know, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I, I knew Carlisi a little bit. He wasn't exactly the, the svelte runner type. <laughs> <laughs> like the Giancana. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and, and that's Chicago. They like that. You, you have a guy that everybody knows that's been out there, Joe Ferriola, who's that, that, that name is on the tips of the government's tongue. And here you've got a Sam Carlisi in the background quietly doing things. 
and, and taking actions and, and being in charge of stuff, but you got the government focused on Joe Ferriola. Cause you know, I tell you, I've been part of that. You only have so many resources. And, and so whoever comes up to the top bubbles up the top, you go after him. And so it's, it's the way Chicago's always operated. Uh, you know, got uh, Jan- Sam Giancana getting all the heat out front or or later on kind of Iupa was pretty well known. And Tony Accardo was way back in the back. And Paul Rica just, you know, said, hey, you know, do this and do that. And, and given their OK to a lot of stuff. So that's Chicago. And all the way back to Frank Nitty. Yeah. Yeah. Paul Absolutely. Rica. Kind of, he, he refined that with Frank Nitty, didn't he? He was to me. He's like the first guy that did that. Uh, stayed in the background and was powerful while Nitty was out there, and everybody knew Nitty. Yeah, you see Nitty in the press, but then if you look closely into the background, you'll see booking photographs of not Nitty, but Rika getting arrested with Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky. And, yeah, you know, and that's <laughs> that's where the real power is. Yeah, really. So he uh Carlisi, he moves on up and and he now he's got other crews that are doing things for him. He does some stuff with Lenny Patrick. And I know Paul, you you know a lot about the Lenny Patrick crew, which was a really powerful crew at the time. And and uh, so talk a little bit about what what Carlisi got into and who was he doing it with. There's a lot of names in here, I know. And it's, oh. And Boy, you them. know, this is still during the golden age of the outfit when, when the power was enormous and they still held the first ward and they still held the contacts in the police department and they still own Cicero. So Carlisi's running that outfit at, at full strength that, of course, was soon with the end of Carlisi, it started to dismantle. And that's probably a discussion for later. But he was doing everything the outfit was doing, uh, loan sharking, gambling, all, all these things that are now taken over by the government or by private industry. We didn't <laughs> yeah. have payday loans and we didn't have casinos and, and, and video right. poker and bars and yeah. you know, all these things. Even marijuana now in Illinois is, is legal. Same so, making on your phone. <laughs> yes, betting on your phone. So before the government squeezed the mob out of all these businesses, or at least he ran it all and and, and he ran it. Uh, it, supposedly in cooperation with an Elmwood Park uh, capo by the name of Johnny DeFranzo, who was very close to Accardo. Now, Accardo's getting to be old at this time. He's in there, is into his eighties. He's got lung cancer, which he survived. Uh, heart trouble. He's spending most of his time in Palm Springs, uh, California, in their condo out there, uh, the uh, outfit uh, haven of the West. And so Carlisi is running things with an iron fist. He doesn't consult with DeFranzo. He doesn't inform DeFranzo. He essentially ignores DeFranzo and uh, does things on his own. Uh, Accardo is eventually pulled in from, from Palm Springs to sit down with DeFranzo and Carlisi. And there are surveillance photographs mm-hmm. of this meeting. They wow. come out of a restaurant. I'm sure you've seen them. Uh, DeFranzo opens the door for Ricardo, who looks bent over and old and weak. And Carlisi drives them from this restaurant. I can't remember if it was Carol Stream, I think it was in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, Carlisi was so bullheaded that he even ordered a hit on one of Ricardo's closest friends, which Man. would have been unheard of in the outfit. But I think that tells us a little bit about you know, the myth that, that Tony Accardo was the final word on everything till the day he died. I don't think that's really the reality of it. Um, that even though he was greatly respected and given some deference till the day he died, he was not running things on a day-to-day basis by any means. Uh, Sam Carlisi was. And that's, in my mind, proven by the attempted murder of Dominic Sinise, who was very close to Accardo. Uh, John DeFranzo was not consulted about that uh, or notified as he certainly would have tried to put a stop to it because DeFranzo was Elmore Park. He was a Cardo's man, would have done something about it, would, would have tried to get somebody to stop it. And it didn't happen. And and the rift between DeFranzo and Carlisi got so deep when DeFranzo's brother, Joey, got popped for trying to go marijuana in the western suburbs in Inverness. 
Uh, he he got caught with a, this farcical attempt at a at a marijuana farm. They never produced an ounce of smokable marijuana, but they took over a guy's a, a juice loan debtor's house and made it into a grow. And DeFranzo was arrested. The, the outfit was embarrassed. Carlisi issued a death warrant for Joey DeFranzo. This is his underboss's son. Wow. Um, and uh, John DeFranzo pretended to go along with it. But uh, he actually hid Joey in Florida uh, in the home of another person who we, we all know and uh, survived. He, he managed to get out from under it until Carlisi was indicted and, and, and went to federal prison. So that's how deep the rift was there at the top of the outfit in, in what I consider the final days of the outfit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really. You know, and, I, and I was reading about that. Uh, Jimmy Marcello was uh, was. Uh... Carlisi's underboss, and of course, he'll move on up and be part of the family secrets operation, and and I guess maybe even considered the boss at, at, at by that time later on in his career. So again, he comes out of this Cicero based crew. So it's it all comes back to Cicero. It seems to be like every time you turn somebody over, it comes back to Cicero. I was looking up some of these. Uh, this Anthony Zizo was was part of that crew. Also, was his third in command, and, and had a, had a crew working. And they had all these loan sharking going. And they were pretty slick. They you know they'd have gambling. Uh, had a gambling operation going, and then the gamblers would get in, and then they turn them over to the loan sharks, and loan sharks would pay off their gambling debts, and and then they would you know they would then be able to get the loan shark money out of them i mean they were making money coming and going uh, uh that crew of, of carlisi's was with lenny patrick too i mean they made a lot of money like that well yeah and lenny patrick of course was it was in rogers park and he essentially ran that neighborhood for the outfit and that's what makes the outfit so interesting gary as you know we talked about sicilians and right. neapolitans but uh, lenny patrick was jewish jewish and he had run the Lawndale neighborhood in the 40s and 50s. Uh, but the Jewish population migrated largely to Rogers Park in the 60s, 50s and 60s. And Lenny Patrick got permission to go with him. And even though he was Jewish, he was a capo in all but name. Right. Very powerful, very, very influential guy. Uh, I, I remember him very well. And he was... He had that look of a caged animal. I mean, he, he was in his early 70s at the time, but uh, he single-handedly wiped out the top echelon of the of the outfit. Now, did he what, was he testifying in this uh, Carlisi, uh, that RICO case they did with Carlisi and his crew, Zizzo, and uh, 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 this uh, Chiaramonte and, and, and all those guys? Did Lenny he Patrick sure did. testify in that? Okay. He, he started with Gus Alex. And testified against Gus Alex. And, and that was a fascinating trial. I got to sit next to Antoinette Giancana and listen yeah. to her comments while Lenny <laughs> Patrick was testifying. You know, the mafia princess. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she really had some colorful thoughts about, about Lenny Patrick. Uh, I bet she did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he took down Gus Alex, which was the, the connection guy. guy. Yeah. And, and then moved on to Carlisi, Marcello, Chiarmonte, Zizzo, and the whole Cicero crew. Here, here's one of the, I, I wrote down some of these quotes and it came out in that trial. It, there was a gambler named Anthony Pape who had failed to make good on a gambling debt, $15,000 gambling debt. And the guy that sent after him said, you know, not God's not even going to help you. And then later on, they threatened to beat him. It was said they beat his head until it turned so black and blue that he had, they think he had hair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they were, they were masters of that. There was another pretty interesting little, uh, uh, Oh, they, they, they told a guy that, uh, that he better come back in a week with the payment when he didn't come back. Then they caught him again and they put a wire around his neck and they choked him and, threatened to mess him up and he and he said he he took a dump in his pants. He was so scared. And and then he got away and he avoided him for a couple of years. And then a couple of years later they tried to collect it again and and end up burning his car. I mean, these guys were uh they were old school uh collection enforcers, weren't they? Oh boy, Char- you know uh, Tony the Hatch, Chiamonte, was <laughs> the star of a lot of these these recorded 
uh, intimidations. He, he put a guy on a hot griddle. Oh. Uh, he stabbed a guy in the face with a fork. Uh, one guy was wearing a wire, and you can hear him saying, don't choke me, don't choke me. You know, the FBI is listening while this guy's getting worked <laughs> over. Uh, and, of course, the hatch wound up uh, falling in this, this war for power after Cicero kind of disintegrates a little bit. But said, he boy, you're right, Gary, they're fine. said he could discipline his son by treating him like a stranger. So yeah. he beat him, beat him like a stranger. Wow. <laughs> These guys were cold, weren't they? <laughs> not not in in poor in person when i saw these guys day day in and day out carlisi especially was very genteel huh. very friendly every morning it was always good morning uh, how's your evening you know and everything was fine and very friendly guy marcelo a little more scary but tony the hatch i'll tell you what he would he would turn your heart to ice just looking at that guy Wow. Now, you remember the story about wanting to kill? No, I, I'll, I'll take that back. Oh, yeah, Jeep's Dadino. Wanting sure. to kill Jeep's Dadino. That, you remember that story? What was, what was the story with that? That was something to do with Lenny Patrick. And that was a, that, t- that took an unusual twist with the guy they sent out, that Mario yeah. Ray, I uh, can't, Raynone, I believe. Yep. Well, well, Jeep's Dadino was a, was a, elderly mobster that uh, they were afraid was going to cooperate. He, he had a, a case out there. Carlisi was uh, reported as saying, you know, if that Jeeps talks, a lot of people are going to get hurt, including me. Yeah. And so he gave the order to Marcelo and Marcelo dispatched Mario Renone. And, and uh, Renone's job was just to get the door open, you know, and get in there and take care of Didino. And on the way, he noticed he was being uh, followed by two outfit guys, one of whom was Willie the Beast Messino, mm. one of the most feared uh, enforcers in outfit history. And Renone figured, hey, you know what? They're getting a twofer here. <laughs> they're gonna, I'm going to kill the Dino, and they're going to kill me to erase any connections back to the top. So Renone flipped, at least temporarily. Yeah. Unflipped again, but in the course of flipping, he gets Lenny Patrick. Okay. Lenny Patrick then flips and gets Gus Alex on a wire at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in the corridor there where they would meet. Got some incriminating conversations on Gus Alex. Lenny Patrick then unflipped. (laughs) They indict him on all these things. He's 72 years old. He knows that if he doesn't do something, he'll die in prison. And Lenny Patrick then unflipped again. And it all started with the attempt to kill poor Jeeps. Well, uh, yeah, and we did, a, Cam and I did a podcast on that. The the year of the informant, the year of the stool pigeon, I think it was 1989. Yeah. All these guys flipped during that year, flipped over and flipped back and then flipped over. And it, it was a banner year for the G, as they call them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they really did did really well. You had you had uh, Renone and Patrick and uh, Gerald Scapelli, um, but it, it you know it, it turned out okay for Renone. He's now a free man mm. um, back in Cicero, and uh, he's on the straight and narrow. As far as as everybody knows, he's left the mm. life behind him. And uh, of course, Scarpelli didn't turn out so well for him. He hung himself in the MCC. In the bathroom, somehow he did it with his hands tied behind his back. I haven't yeah. figured out how he did that. <laughs> one of those, yeah, it's another one of those hotly debated outfit uh, outfit uh, topics. It's been coming up on on online recently. It's uh, it's uh, we'll, we'll always always go down as a mystery whether he uh, yeah. how he was able to hang himself with his arms behind his back, <laughs> and there were multiple opportunities for people to uh, assist him. And that, yeah, uh, sort of sort of giving the Kevorkian treatment. Yeah, <laughs> uh, including Frank the German Swice. I was gonna say that's room. what Red Womanette said that Frank the German Swice was was in the MCCC at the say or MCC at the same time. It's kind of like the uh, uh, canary could sing but couldn't fly story, huh? <laughs> yeah, very much like that. <laughs> I just interviewed a guy that wrote the book about uh, Abe Rellis. It's a, it's a pretty interesting story. He was an interesting guy. 
So now it's 1992, and and most uh, uh, Carlisi's crew have, you know, gotten indicted, and you know they're kind of all in disarray. The government goes after you know whoever rises to the top. Once again, these guys have risen to the top. The government goes after them, and and they've been indicted, and and Zizo, and and um, a lot of them did their time, I guess, and you know went through the appeal process and are back out, and and then operate, and then now there's some kind of a uh raising up against Carlisi. Is that what you're saying? They, well go ahead, Camillus. Well yeah, I, I mean, well you what uh what happened to Car because I think you you'd be more familiar with uh with the demise of Carlisi and, and the order uh and maybe the order they get out. I know Charmonte got out in ninety eight. Um but Carlisi died was it ninety six or ninety seven, Paul? Uh, New Year's Day, 1997. Okay. He was uh, he's having congestive heart failure. Okay. And the medical treatment he received was they grabbed him and physically dragged him to a golf cart to take him to the medical unit. And uh, it was so traumatic, he had a massive heart attack and died mm. in the golf cart. Uh, so he never came out. What was his What was his sentence? How what was he? Was that a Was that a RICO trial? It was, yeah, it was a RICO case. Um, you know, I'd have to check my notes on what exactly. He, his sentence was actually vacated, as was his conviction. That's right. Because the appeal was still pending when he died. Hmm. So the government just vacated the conviction. Yeah. Um, and, and which, you know, that's a compassionate thing to do for the family. But uh, with Carlisi gone off the street, there you had John DeFranzo, who was the titular head of the the outfit from 92, 93, when Carlisi's in. Now, some people will say Carlisi ran things until he died in early 97, but uh, DeFranzo was the guy on the yeah. street. Yeah, you had sort time. of a sort of a trifecta almost in a way. You had because you had what year did um, Lombardo got out, but he was sort of a non non-entity it was in 90 it was in the early 90s and you had joe the builder uh who was out too uh and sort of the top of that the top of that trifecta would have been uh uh johnny bananas uh defonzo so you had these three powerhouses as, as i sort of i've always sort of seen it but like johnny the the final word would have been uh defonzo uh, out of these these three these three sort of elders that were running things was was kind of how I was my sort of because the way I was on the outfit except under Carlisi was was kind of it was it was they dispersed power in a way so that if one went down they they yeah. wouldn't, you wouldn't cripple the entire organization and Carlisi went for the more traditional sort of leadership role is that is that does that sound about right Paul or you you see it a little differently no I I think you're absolutely right Camilla. Um, you also have in there Willie Messino. Oh uh, yeah, was part time underboss uh, under um, Carlisi for Kansas City matters because he had relatives in Kansas City. Uh, Messino and Lombardo actually had a conversation when Carlisi went down. Lombardo suggested that Willie Messino ought to take it from DeFranzo, mm -hmm. and Messino by this time, you know, he was around in the. 40s the 50s the 60s yeah, yeah. the 70s he's tired uh, he's done prison time uh he's got grandchildren that he loved very much and he said there's no way that he's going to do that and uh, he spent his final years taking his kids grandkids to school watching them play baseball and he let john defranzo run the outfit interesting so where does Jimmy Marcellos fit into this? He's like an up and comer during this time because he's going to move on up. Marcello was born forty years too late. Honestly, he uh, he really had, had Marcello been born well, maybe thirty years after he should have. He was a real ice cold guy who, who really came about. Uh, he was a, an old school mobster with with that icy stare and uh I, I really think that he was more old school than a lot of the guys that that he sort of came up with and i think that if he, if he had if he had been around in the in the the uh the 50s instead of born in the 50s he would have he would have been uh he he was very successful obviously but i think that he just would have fit in in that era a little bit better and, and the law enforcement probably would have uh 
I mean, the, I've been as successful in getting him with uh, with a lot of the things they did. I think that he he would have been successful in a, in another era and, and really fit in in an earlier time. I was like, uh, I read him. It's real um, interesting you say that because Judge Zagel said the same thing to him essentially, saying you have abilities that your co defendants do not have. Mm-hmm. And it's I regret very much that you used them in the way that you did. Uh, but you will pay for your crimes. And he recognized exactly what you did, Camillus, and that Marcella was a was a person of unique talent. Uh, interesting. He, so, yeah, he, he, so they come out one by one, Charmante, and then you get Zizzo out. Zizzo's father ran the area I live in, uh, uh, northwest Indiana. And then finally, in uh, uh, Zizzo came out in 2001, and he ostensibly uh, took over Cicero when... Uh, uh, Big Mike Spano went down when the uh, the Cicero town president, Becky Lauren Maltese, went down. There was a big corruption trial in Cicero, and the then capo of the Cicero crew was a guy named Big Mike Spano. And he went down. We don't that's a that's another that's another show idea. But basically the capo of, of Cicero went to prison in uh, in early uh, 2003, January of 2003. And ostensibly, control of Cicero was to be given to Zizzo until uh, Marcello came out. Okay, and, and you said Spano. I think you meant Sarno, right? No, I meant Spano. Spano. There, was a, there was a Mike Spano. Oh, okay. I, I stand corrected there. Yeah, he was. You know, he was a, a low key guy, and uh, uh, but at the same time, to speak to your point, you did have Mike Sarno consolidating power. Yeah, and he was in the same rackets as the uh, the Marcella brothers and Zizzo and uh, uh, Charmante, who uh, who was um, who was dead by this point. Uh, Charm- Z- Zizzo came out in uh, October twenty fourth of two thousand and one, and Tony the Hatch, who was the muscle for their crew, was murdered on November twenty fourth of two thousand and one. So it was it was just. The domino fell immediately, and the Sarno crew was responsible for that hit. They saw that if if this uh, if this other crew grew in power, if their muscle came out, and okay. they immediately started consolidating. So they they recognized that competition immediately. The the fat Mike Sarno crew, and you did a good show on that, uh, right? Mike Sarno. So there was a lot of butting heads and a lot of uh, a lot of upheaval going on in. Uh, Cicero at the time under this capo, uh, Mike Spano. Okay, all right, I, I stand corrected on that. So um, my head's kind of dizzy now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's this is where it really starts, where you really start getting a lot of the names as guys come out of prison, and a lot of this maelstrom starts going on, uh, because the another leader of the outfit. Had just died. Uh, uh, this is uh, Johnny Apes Monteleone died of cancer in 2001. And then you get just pell mell a bunch of outfit guys in Cicero and all over start killing each other and start fighting about who's going to take over. It's, you know, there was a, a vacuum of power left in his absence. And that was the catalyst for a lot of this conflict over the next several years. Especially after the family secrets trial took out a whole other crew of them. That was a, that was another domino that fell a little later. And keep in mind that at the very top, you've got John DeFranzo, who was making so much money legitimately. Mm-hmm. He wanted nothing to do with the risks of being outfit boss. He benched his whole Elmwood Park crew. As a matter of fact, uh, Willie Messino. I, I think he had two foreclosures filed against different homes that he owned. And mm. uh, it was hard times for the Elmwood Park crew. So there's really not a strong hand at, at the top for the outfit. And that's what allowed this kind of inner Nicene fighting that Camillus is talking about to break out. It's almost as if the outfit became more of a unrelated group of several crews mm-hmm rather than the unified group that it, it had been all these years. Yeah, this this really speaks to Paul's point and, 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 a, Paul that, and, a, and a point that, that he's made several times, that the outfit crumbled after Carlisi 
went away. He was the last leader of the outfits. You've got DeFranzo, who came in afterwards. DeFranzo moved to decentralized leadership. He was making so much legitimate money, as Paul said. He didn't want the street rackets, so he, he broke up his crew, Elmer Park's ability to make money. He, he kicked off the uh, leadership to this Johnny Aves Monteleone, who died in 2001. DeFranzo more or less washed his hands of everything except being an advisory role. You've got uh, the boss of Cicero going away in the early 2000s. And without that clear leadership that Carlisi provided, that iron hand leadership of, of these men who are sociopaths and killers and, and racketeers, each crew begins to crumble in its own way. You see uh, a murder in, in, the, uh, in the Chinatown crew. You see, uh, this, as Paul said, this entire scene war in uh, Cicero. You see a general breakdown of of all sorts of, of things going on in multiple crews in the outfit. Uh, the Elmwood Park crew, guys have, guys who are really powerful, having a hard time making ends meet. Uh, and it's this vacuum of power that was left by going back to Carlisi's arrest. And it really just took a couple of years to build for that tension to build. And it all really exploded in the early 2000s. And when the Carlisi crew came out of prison to try and reestablish that dominance, you've got they're being picked off one by one. People recognize their power, like Sarno's crew recognize their power. And don't want them to reestablish. So is, would that be who killed this Anthony Zizzo? He he went down. He was one of the last ones to go down, really, out of this deal. Or if we say that they, they they don't know what happened to him. They hit his body. He did a, a, a Lupara Blanca, I think they call that in Sicily. Where you never find the body. <laughs> Why? Uh, right. That's right. Right. White right shotgun. shotgun. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what happened. Is with with Zizzo. His protection was Marcelo from the top and Chiaramonte from below. Mm -hmm. Marcelo was still in prison until 2003, and they took out Chiaramonte, mm -hmm. uh, which, by the way, was done by another uh, Calabrese, totally unrelated to the Calabrese we're so used to talking about. Oh, that was that other Calabrese. Uh, yeah, uh, Tony, Tony, Tony Calabrese. Calabrese. Tony, yeah. Yeah. Is Most he still around? Is he, whatever happened to him? Oh, he died. Died, died in prison. prison. Okay. He appealed to President Trump for a release in uh, Oh the yeah, I Senate remember now. And uh died in prison. He did. So that's why you see Zizzo disappearing is his production was gone. Yeah. And yeah, he's kind and of so, the last of the old school, it seems like. In in a lot of ways. You know what Sarno did when he took over the Cicero Street crew in, in two thousand and one. He formed a very close alliance with the outlaw street gang, uh, motorcycle gang. Motorcycle gang, yeah. And uh, Mark Polchan. And uh, he ran his heavy stuff through Polchan and Polchan's associates. And, of course, they all wound up getting indicted for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, pipe bombs and intimidation. And they had a theft. They stole like $12 million worth of jewelry and a in a host of uh, burglaries at uh, jewelry stores and private residences all over the Chicago area and wound up getting indicted for all of it. And they fenced it all through Polchan's Goldberg jewelers. Yeah. And so it was a different era. You know, the outfit had used motorcycle gangs for all kinds of things over the years, but this close alliance just goes to show that the, the power that they used to wield uh, died with Carlisi. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I had that uh, ATF agent Lou Veloso on, and and he infiltrated Polchan uh, and, and his little operation uh, based on the bombing of the, the Hispanic guy that wouldn't uh, let them put their video poker Sardo's video poker machines into his store, and and he wouldn't give up. I mean, he was not giving in to him even after they bombed him, and he ended up testifying against Sarno. And, uh, hell, they had an ATF agent, you know, infiltrated and, and into that operation. I mean, it was, uh, it was full of holes. They had all those pecker woods, as we call them down here in Kansas City, uh, uh, as close to them and, and all the people involved in that bombing, they were mainly pecker woods and, and people you didn't know anything about. And, and it was, uh, Sarno was, was he, I guess, 
they had just lost so much power. There was not anybody that would would be part of, you know, any mafia types, anybody that would practice any omerta and be loyal. And he didn't engender any loyalty because they all end up testifying against him, it seemed to me like. Yeah. Frank Calabrese predicted and said, uh, he, he said, oh, you know, the Christmas tree, it'll get narrower and narrower and then it won't hold it. It collapses. Yeah. The, the, the Christmas tree won't stand up. Uh, Calabrese in his, in his constantly speaking code, but one of those recorded conversations, he said that uh, the Christmas tree, it's, it'll get so thin. It's just, it, there's, it'll never hold. It'll never stand up. And, mm. and he was very patient. I mean, he was exactly right. It, it, it didn't. Um, and so things just are completely fragmented. There are, it, that's not to say there's not some powerful operators out there now, but it's, it's not now what it was, uh, in the, in the early nineties, in, in really? the late eighties. What is there just one big crew now? Or is there two crews? You know, I, I have think the idea. there are two. two. Yeah. But I don't know that the two might have much to do with each other. No. <laughs> No consolidation. Now, I, I just saw an interview that Sally De Laurentiis, uh, uh, he's like, you know, he, he's not even a Bob guy, it seems like, the way he was talking. <laughs> Millionaire pizza operator. So he was supposed to be the next boss or something. I, I don't know. It's hard to keep up with it. But uh, saw him, an interview with him, and he's like some kind of a businessman talking. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's I remember that interview. That's real interesting. That's the one where he says, "Hey, you know, if gambling were legal, we'd be members of the Chamber of Commerce." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and as you said, Paul, everything that they made their money off of is now taken over and licensed by the government in some manner. <laughs> Outfit of gamblers. <laughs> I tell exactly you what, right. I, I first started practicing law. I, I did consumer protection. And I and this was kind of earlier in the days of the payday lending, and and it was crazy. I mean, these poor old gals, they they'd always have some kind of a job. They're always a single mom that had sometimes a government job, a clerk's job, or something, or some kind of a regular job, and they'd gone in because they needed to be get a little, you know, a little tied them over for something. And then they refinance, they refinance, they charge them a finder's fee each time. And the in, uh, the rate was about 500%, 400 and some percent. And we looked at the statues and of course they opened it up for small loans, any rate they wanted to charge. And, and, and it was just like they were in, in servitude basically to the payday loan companies the rest of their lives. It was just, it was crazy. Well, that's just how juice worked. Yeah, exactly how juice worked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I suppose there's still some uh, businessmen out there that might need an extra big loan, not a small loan, and and go to the juice uh, juice loan lender. Although I don't know if anybody even does that anymore. Oh yeah, as a matter of fact, I I heard a real interesting story about um, someone coming to Gus Alex for a quarter million dollars, and it turned out that he this guy was uh, one of Clinton's officials. In the White House, <laughs> <Not> really? <laughs> yeah. So you you know they still do, and they need a big amount of money, and they want to keep it quiet. Where are they going to get it? That's There's true. A certain governor who uh, established his hotel empire by uh, through Teamsters loans in the uh, in the uh, whose father established his uh, his uh, hotel his three billion dollar hotel empire through Teamsters loans. Yeah, and that's who I it was uh, I just I was just reading the briefs. That's that sounds vaguely like a gangster business plan, Camilla. <laughs> shocking. Shocking. <laughs> a certain a governor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna say which uh, outfit related state that is, but uh, <laughs> but there's only one. <laughs> which, which wealthiest governor in the uh, in the uh, in the country? Of course, then there's the other scam, which I had a client get into this, is the advanced fee scam. Hey, we can get you that loan. We know you barely qualify for it and, and you're really hurting for money, but we can get you that loan. Just give us $2,500 up front. We, we've got, uh, I talked to these guys and they were slick. We, we've got four or five different banks that will even name off some kind of esoteric kind of lending institution. We've got them lined. They're ready to go. But, but you know, we got to get $2,500 up front. Like, come on, dude. I, yeah. I finally, I said, I made them mad. I said, okay, 
you get me a letter on the letterhead from one of those banks, or you give me a contact person to call and talk to about who got this loan and how that worked with you guys. And boy, this guy got mad. Finally, I think he just hung up on me. (laughs) It's, uh, you know, there's always another scam out there in there. You bet. There's always somebody. And, And there still is illegal gambling, even though it's perfectly legal, even on your phone, there are just guys that, yeah, For whatever reason, they they need a bookmaker. It's not like it used to be, but even in Vegas, you you got a, a illegal books going on there still to this day. Yeah, somebody that can't get credit, and they can you know they got friends, and they like to go in the bar and make the bet with the guy that they look in him in the eye, and and uh, and uh, and bookmakers historically they don't ask for any money up front, right? Just settle up when it's done. And so it's uh, there's a certain glamour to that. I know a guy that probably is still doing that. I haven't talked to him for a while since Kansas got legalized, but I bet he's still doing that. You know, he just yeah. liked that life. Yeah, and older, older, older people too don't know how to get in on the phone. I mean, yeah. you know, I, it, my yeah. mother has her own problems with the phone. I think she, you know, if she were a gambling woman, I think it would be easier to just call the bookie down the street. And try <laughs> to figure yeah. Out. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, this has been a fun uh, examination of the uh, latter days, shall we say, of the Chicago outfit. There, there's more to this story. Uh, I mean, there's a lot more names and everything in there, but uh, we kind of gave you a pretty good overview of, of the latter days of the the old outfit when they were so powerful. They had the Teamsters. They had, and through the Teamsters, as I always like to say, you can now own politicians because the mm-hmm. teamsters can give them big donations. Uh, you know, they won't take a donation from Nick Savell or Joey Aupa or Tony Accardo. They're not going to do it, but they'll take one from the teamsters union. And, and you know, there's, there's the hook right there. And, uh, That's right. That's and then exactly the teamsters right. pension fund, like you guys mentioned, if, 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 you don't need to loan shark the money. You don't even need to have the money. You can just, Arrange for the money to come by the teacher's pension fund. And oh, by the way, you got to kick me back a little bit of money for doing this. And and so it's uh, they've lost all that. And especially the politicians, the political end of it. That, yeah. That's what uh, when you guys agree, that's the that was the death knell. Of oh, yeah. The mob throughout the whole United States as they started losing any influence they had over politicians. Oh, yeah. And then by extension, the court systems. Oh, yeah. That's what killed Chicago. Loss of Gus, Alex and Carl. Carlisi, that was cut them off at the knees. Yep. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate y'all doing this. And uh, you guys out there, don't forget, I ride a motorcycle. And if you see a motorcycle, give him some room. <laughs> give it, look for us. Uh, if you have a problem with PTSD and you've been a member in the service or you have a friend or a relative and they've been in the service, there's a really good hotline. If you go to the VA's uh, website, you'll find that hotline. So thanks a lot, Paul and Camulus. I really appreciate you guys coming on the show. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely.